Good, good. Good to see you guys. I want to welcome those of you who are here. I want to welcome those who are online or at the C3 Coffee Bar, or let's give it up for people at J. Rubin right now. Move that. So, um, so glad that uh, if you're at the J. Rubin campus or the C3 campus that you're with us today. Um, and uh, just thanks for joining in. And so thankful you're here. You might be new with us, and, and if you are, uh, just, just so thankful you're here. My name's Josh, one of the pastors, and uh, just really counted a privilege that you're just going to take some time and, and hang out with us this morning. And as we get started, um, just in case you didn't know, uh, this weekend is the one-year kind of anniversary, if you want to call it that, of us moving in to this facility. So that's pretty cool, isn't it? Pretty exciting, and, and it's kind of amazing what has happened, what has transpired in the last year. Like, like at first, I, I start thinking about it, and I go, there's no way it's been a whole year. You know what I mean? Like, it seems like, like it, that, that time just flies by. It seems like it was just yesterday that we were moving in. It seems like it was, you know, just yesterday that we were cleaning up from Hurricane Matthew. <sighs> Anybody remember that nastiness? Yeah. You know what I mean? Like, like all that. But, but inside of that, we also have just some things that are crazy that we can just celebrate that's happened this year. Um, we've had over 1,400 people attend this campus for the first time as a first-time guest in the last 365 days. Yeah. And... Um, so, th- so that's huge. Uh, it's huge that, that we've had a, uh, 114 people get baptized in the last 365 days. So, so that, that deserves a little bit louder celebration, okay? Because, I mean, that's huge, all right? That's big steps right there. We've launched two campuses, you know. Um, if you're new and you heard me talking to C3 and J. Rubin, you're like, what is he talking about, all right? Well, you know, last year at this time was the first time that we, we had a church meeting at the C3 Coffee Bar. It had been open for a few weeks before that, but, you know, on this weekend, we started that campus, and there are people who come to church with us every week who attend that campus, that, that attend at the coffee bar, and they're in community there, and we have a host, and we have people who pastor them and take care of them. And the same thing, just a few weeks ago, we launched J. Rubin, uh, you know, a campus at the J. Rubin, uh, uh, J. Rubin Long Detention Center, and uh, great things are going on there. So it's kind of crazy to think all of that has happened in one year, and who knows what we'll be talking about next year at this same time, right? Because we just don't know. When you start dreaming and you start asking God to do things, God can move in an amazing way, and I believe that he's at work here in our church. And if you believe that, let's give him celebration and him praise for everything he's done the last year, okay? Yeah. So, so good, so good. So, hey, um, so let's dive into this theme that we've been on called Behind the Music, and and, uh, what we've done the last couple weeks is... We've had um, somebody from our uh, team, our worship team, kind of give a testimony of, um, you know, a song that was important to them, a song that they really connected with in their worship of God, and uh, they shared that on video, and then we would kind of sing that song. Uh, Today, we're going to start going a little different direction with this theme for the next three weeks, and we're going to kind of look at, well, what's really behind the music, all right? And um, for instance, in three weeks, we're going to talk about one thing that's behind the music is a whole nother aspect of our church that many of y'all don't really know about yet. And, um, you know, there is so much more than what you just see in here. Um, You know, if you just find yourself coming to worship or you just find yourself joining us online, there's a whole nother level, um, a whole nother aspect of our church uh, that we kind of call teams, and those are small group teams or ministry teams. There are things that happen in Kids Rock and Catalyst and small groups that meet throughout the whole week. And, and unfortunately, if you don't know anything about them yet, then you might be missing what is the best part of our church. Um, because it's great what's going on in here and, and how God joins us in here and that we're together in here. But there's a whole nother aspect of our church that we really want to make sure that everybody's aware of that that we would call behind the music, all right? And uh, it really is a great part of our church. So in three weeks, we're going to talk about that. Today, though, what I'm really going to deal with is just, well, what's behind the music? Like, 
Why do we sing the way that we do here at The Rock? Why do we have it at a volume that we do? Why do we have a a band on stage? Why do we have cameras and tech people and and all that 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 are willing to serve and and help out? You know, some people go, well, you know, is it, you know, you just do it because you have good band people that, and good worship leaders who can do it. And, you know, some people go like, well, do you do it just to fill time so that we can get to the sermon? Or, or do you do it, you know, does the rock have, you know, that kind of worship, you know, that kind of music because they're like a rock church, you know what I mean? Like, you know, well, they just like to have haze and they like to have smoke and lights going everywhere and it's more like a concert and all that. And please hear me. None of those are anywhere close to why we do worship the way we do worship. And we have no desire to put on a concert. No desire to to highlight anybody who's on stage, all right? You know, I'm so thankful for the people who serve on our worship team, so thankful for the people who serve on our tech team. I don't know if you realize this, but we have about 60 people um, who are involved with the things that go on in here um, and on stage from a tech or worship aspect, all right? Every weekend, it takes about 25 different individuals to either lead us in worship, to run a camera, to run the soundboard, to run a video board, to do all that. And they would all say, the same thing, that they don't do that for them. We don't do it so that there's any glory that direction. It's all for the sole purpose of God. So what is behind the music at at the rock? It's God and God alone. And I want to talk about that today. I want to just kind of give you a testimony from my heart. As we've had band members kind of share testimonies from their heart via video, I just want to kind of share a testimony from my heart of why we do church the way we do it. And I need to say this right now. There's absolutely no way that I can explain it in one message, all right? Um, there, there's no way that, that <laughs> the, the people who get my sermon notes, they saw it and they're like, Wow, that's going to be a really long message. <laughs> We're going to be here till one o'clock, all right? No, we won't, all right? But what I am going to have to do that's a little different this week is at about some point, basically when I run out of time, I'm just going to cut the sermon off, all right? Because there's no way for me to explain everything that happens in a worship service in one message, and, and, and do so adequately. Um, so I want to kind of walk us through what worship looks like here at The Rock. I want to walk us through what we do when we gather in this room for an hour and 10 minutes, but it will take me two weeks to do it. So, you know, if you're new with us, please come back next week. Um, you know, if you're, for some reason, you got to be gone next week, then make sure you get online afterwards and, um, you know, watch, uh, you know, uh, the message via online so you can kind of finish it. Because again, I'm only going to get through about half of it today. But, but here's what we need to catch as we're going through th- this half, it is that what is behind the music is the worship of God. Um, let me hit this scripture for you. It says this in Psalm 96 verse 1. It says, sing a new song to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. Sing to the Lord. Praise his name. Each day proclaim the good news that he saves. And through this verse and another verse in a second, I want to explain why we do all that we do in here. And I really believe this is going to be critical for us because I know that there's some of you um, that this is your first time ever in here. There's some of you that have maybe been watching from Jay Rubin for the last three or four weeks and, and you wondered like, wow, man, church is different at The Rock than maybe what I'm used to. There's some of you who haven't been to church maybe ever in your life. Or for, for the last 20 years, maybe you've been gone. Or, or maybe you've moved from like Northeast. And, and maybe when you were up in the Northeast, maybe uh, you went to a Catholic church or a Lutheran church. And, and you go, man, it's just different. So I want to explain why we do what we do. Uh, I want to explain things like why we take communion each week. Like why we have it up here on the stage for people if they want to do that. Um, I want to explain, like, why do we do baptism? Like, I know maybe you've been here a couple times, and all of a sudden, in the middle of worship, you'll see somebody's face come up on the screen, and somebody's getting baptized. And you might be going, what is that? Why do we do that? Well, I want to explain all that, and I want to do it inside of this verse. But, but even the communion and the baptism, again, that, I, I won't even be able to get to that this week. That'll all be next week. But this is what I do believe. There's going to be some of you that will take communion for the first time in your life next week. 
I believe there's going to be some of you that, that you're going to get baptized next week and you had no plans on getting baptized. That you're going to start thinking about it just even after hearing that going, well, man, maybe I need to think about this. Maybe I need to wrestle with this this week with God and what would it mean to be baptized? And maybe next week after you hear more about it, you're just going to walk up and say, I want to get baptized right now. Or I want to schedule a baptism for next week when my family can be here. And that's my hope that as we walk through it, we'll start to understand why we do it. But I, it's also important for this reason. Because there's some of you here that you've been coming to The Rock for a long time, or you've had church background in you for a long time. And today is the day that we need to remember why. Why do we sing? Why do we worship? What is it all about? And again, that's where this verse comes in. It's this verse where it says things like this. Sing a new song to the Lord. We need to sing to the Lord. Let the whole earth sing to the Lord. I, I like to kind of, when I look at the, this first part of this verse, I kind of like to think of it this way, that when we're singing, it is all about singing to the Lord. Like we are trying to lift him up. We're trying to declare who he is and praise him for that. But the bottom part of the verse gives us another insight. It says, each day proclaim the good news that he saves. Proclaim it. Proclaim the good news that he saves. When we gather like this, when we worship, when we sing, we're not just lifting God up and worshiping God, but we're also proclaiming what he does. And what he does is he saves people. Anybody thankful for that? Yeah, I know I am. You know what I mean? So I want to worship him because of who he is, but I also want to proclaim what he does. Because what he does is he saves people and he works in people's lives and he inhabits the praise of his people and he comes around them. And this is stuff that people need to hear. And here's the problem too many times, and this has happened in church culture, where churches will say, well, we don't need to sing very much. Oh, we don't, we don't want to alienate people. Let's just do a couple songs. Let's just do this or that. And, and here's what we miss. When we proclaim through song and through worship who God is, that is very attractive to people who don't know who he is. I've seen it time and time again. And that might be you. You might be in here going, man, I don't totally have God figured out. I don't totally know who God is. I'm just really trying to investigate this. But I know that I want what he's got. Because there's something that I can see inside the relationship that he has with God or that she has with God that I haven't found yet. So when you are proclaiming God and glorifying him, people will take notice and be like, wow, I want to know the God that they know. And that's what scripture teaches us. It says this in 1 Corinthians chapter 14. This verse was talking about why you do certain things at church and how to keep an orderly worship and all that. And it says this, it says, as they, and they means those who don't know God yet, as they listen, their secret thoughts will be exposed. Not exposed to the world out loud, but exposed in here. And they will fall to their knees and they will worship God, declaring God is truly here. And guys, I want you to catch that. That's what it's about. Worship is about recognizing that God is here. And with God being in this room, with God being here with us, then we should want to declare him. We should want to worship him. We should want to sing to him. We should want to acknowledge him. Because this is critical. Because unfortunately, there are times and there are churches that God's not at. And, and I hate to see that. And, and I pray like crazy that that could never be said about the rock. And I pray that you will pray that with me. That, that, that there will never be a day that you'll be like, well, I'm going to the rock. And God's going, well, I'm not. But it could happen. There's several scriptures in the book of Revelation, which we'll study later this year, that talk about how God said, I'm not going to be showing up at that church anymore. And my prayer is that that could never be said about here. Because I want the rock to always be a place that God shows up. Well, how do we make sure that that happens? We understand why we worship the way we do. So to do that, let's, let's keep digging. Let's go to another scripture. It says this in Isaiah chapter 6, verse 1. 
It says it was in the year that King Uzziah died, all right? Now, that's just a historical reference, all right? Jeremiah was a prophet. He was a guy who was called by God to proclaim who God was. And, and at this point, he's proclaiming who God is. He's writing this, and he uses this just as a historical reference. It means about 750 BC is when he wrote this. So it was the year King Uzziah died that I saw the Lord. I saw him. He was sitting on a lofty throne, and the train of his robe filled the temple. I want you to make sure you catch this. This is pretty important stuff. I saw the Lord. I saw that, that God was, you know, inhabiting his throne room. I, I, I got a visual of who God is. And what I saw was he was sitting on a throne, meaning he's the one in charge, and his train Well, it filled the entire temple. And what he's trying to say there is his presence filled the entire space. The easiest way for me to say this is Isaiah saw God and he saw that God was big. God's huge. God is enormous. God is mighty. You know, and and what Isaiah saw, he was like, "I, I don't even know how to explain it. Maybe you've seen things um, like the Grand Canyon. Anybody here ever seen the Grand Canyon? I mean, it's huge. It's massive. And when you go there and you look at the Grand Canyon, it's like, wow, you know? Um, Anybody here ever seen Hoover Dam? All right, so Hoover Dam. I remember last time I was flying out west, I was actually flying over Vegas, and I looked down and I could see the dam. And I was just like, even from thousands of feet up in the sky, the thing looked massive. The stars, you start staring at the stars. When you start staring at the stars, you start to realize how big they are. You, you know, you think about our sun and, and how big it is, but how small it is in comparison to the rest, rest of the galaxy. I saw a picture a couple of weeks ago of somebody took um, from Pauly's Island that captured the Milky Way. Now, I've seen pictures of the Milky Way a bunch in my life, and I'm sure you have as well. But to see it taken from just like down the road from us was crazy. But when you looked at the Milky Way, you go, man, how vast is the universe? Yet all of that is little compared to our God because our God is the one who spoke it into existence. God said, well, here, universe, there you go. Star, there you go. All right, Uh, Grand Canyon, there it is. You know what I mean? Like God spoke things into existence. He brought this earth, this world to be. So what we need to understand is as big as those things are, they are tiny in comparison with who God is. So we've got to keep that mindset because I think it can happen if we're not careful that we'll we'll come to, to church and we'll go, well, yeah, I'm just going to church. Yeah, I'm just going to hang out with some friends. You know, we'll do a little bit of stuff. And I think sometimes we forget that when we walk in this room, that there is a big God here waiting for us. And we need to recognize that, wow, God is huge. And I get to go and meet with him. But, but it goes a step further when we, when we start talking about this. It's not just that God is big. It's this ne- ne- next part of this verse. It says this. Attending him, meaning attending God, were mighty seraphim. Uh, seraphim, the best way to say that is they're kind of like angelic beings. Um, each having six wings. With two wings, they covered their faces. With two, they covered their feet. And with two, they flew. So I want you to kind of visualize what's going on as you've got these angelic type beings that are surrounding the throne. And as they're surrounding the throne, they've got these massive wings. And with two of their wings, they're covering their face. With two of their wings, they're they're covering their feet. What they're doing is they're saying, in the presence of God, I am not worthy. And they're covering themselves as an act of humility. But in the essence of that, what I want you to make sure you see here is that these huge, massive beings, angelic beings, they understand the object of worship is God. That, that in our world, we often talk about guardian angels. We talk about, oh, I'd love to see an angel. But you know who angels want to see? God. And that's where we need to keep our focus. We need to keep our focus solely on God because he is the subject. He is the object of worship. Now, let me pause here for a second and just say, this can be difficult. 
It's easy to get sidetracked here. It's easy to get a little off course. And rather than making God the object of worship, we end up making ourselves the object of worship. And I know at first we're all like, well, no, 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 no. I know it's, it's all about God. But, but what ends up happening is sometimes we'll, we'll, we'll come to church, we'll have an experience like this, and, and we'll, we'll, we'll make things a little bit more where I want to be satisfied rather than I want to glorify who God is. It happens in little statements that you might not even realize. Saying things like, man, I, I hope, I hope Kalak plays my favorite song this weekend. Or um, I hope this person's on stage. Or I hope that person is preaching. Or, or man, I, I hope Josh doesn't preach about this because I'm bringing a friend with me and I don't want my friend to have to, have to hear a message about that. Y- y'all know I'm thinking money. That's what y'all are thinking right now too, right? Okay, y'all like, you know, when I bring a guest, I hope it's not a money series or something. But you know what I'm saying? You know what I mean? Like we'll start thinking those. And those thoughts on them, in, in themselves... I'm not wrong, okay? I don't want you to think that. But you have to be careful because if that thought process rolls too much in your head, then what you're ending up doing is you're saying, I want the worship service to satisfy me. I want the worship service to entertain me. And guys, in our environment, especially because of the way we do church, that can be difficult. We really have to be careful because, you know, bottom line is, I want church to be fun. You know what I'm saying? And I think you want church to be fun. I don't think you're, you're waking up in the morning saying, man, I hope I have a horrible time at church today. You know what I mean? Like, like no, we want it to be a, a good time. We want to enjoy being with our friends and enjoy meeting new people and enjoy worshiping God. But, but, but you know, and when we bring lights and sound and haze and stuff like that in, you know, it can be difficult. And How to best say it is we want that because I want, maybe especially if you don't have a church background, I want you to come and realize that that church can connect with you on your level, that that God can connect with you, that you can connect with God. But we just have to be careful because if we're not careful, it ends up worship becomes consumer-driven. It becomes entertainment It becomes more for self-satisfaction. It becomes more for my emotional experience. And rather than glorifying God, we we end up gratifying ourselves. And again, I'm just saying be careful. And and I'll, I'll just be real with you. I'll just share my heart, all right? Because I'm guessing that you struggle with this because I know I struggle with it. I mean, I get up here and talk on a lot of weekends. And, and, uh, there's many times that when the sermon's coming to an end and, and I'm done that I walk off the, the, the stage and, and I head back towards the connect corner that, that I have inwardly, I, I start thinking, you know, I, I wonder if that connected. I wonder if that made sense and, oh, I need to say that better. And, and if I'm doing, saying things like that because I'm wanting to evaluate and do the very best I possibly can at communicating who God is and what he does, that's one thing. But I have to be honest, there's times in my heart that I know the reason I'm asking those questions in my head is because I want you to like me. You know what I mean? Like, like I go, I want them to have liked that message. And, and I'm just being transparent with you that I have to fight against that and I have to guard against that to make sure that I am pleasing God, not man. Um, and... and I've shared with y'all before, I am anything far from perfect. So I have to wrestle with that. And my guess is if I have to wrestle with that, that we all have to wrestle with that when it comes to the song I like and stuff like that. Does that make sense? So we need to make sure we're keeping God as the focus. Because if he's the focus, then he will do great things. Well, how do we keep him the focus? Well, I think part of it is, is we make sure that we continually keep him as the subject matter. But in addition to that, as the subject matter, let's worship who he is and then what he has done, or at least what he's wanting to do in your life. And and for that, let me just go on to this next part of this scripture. It says this, 
It says they, meaning those seraphim, those angelic type beings, they were calling out to each other, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of heaven's armies. The whole earth is filled with his glory. What these angels are doing is they're, they're crying out, holy, holy, holy. Uh, what that means is they were saying to God, God, you are set apart. God, you are different. God, you are above all things. They're saying, God, uh, this word holy means um, that, that you, God, you are above people, that God, you are above the angels, that God, you are above, you are different than all other gods. God, you are totally set apart. You alone are worthy, all right? That's what holy means. So they're, they're singing out to God, all right? The other thing they're doing, though, is they're declaring the whole earth is filled with his glory. The whole earth, they're saying, God, all of this earth, all of this creation is filled with your presence. That, God, you are doing work here on this earth. And what they're doing is they're, they're vertically worshiping God, but they're also horizontally worshiping God, vertically by declaring who he is, horizontally by declaring what he does. Uh, maybe a, a good way for me to illustrate this is to just show you some... Um, just some pictures, excuse me if I can get this right, um, that uh, to draw it up like this, some people think that, you know, you worship God like, like in a horizontal way, that, that you just kind of praise him, if I could say it that way. And, and the thought there is, you know, the angels, the seraphim, they were saying that his presence fills the whole earth. And, and this idea of horizontal worship happens when we're declaring what he has done. Um, it, it happens like maybe if you go to the beach and you're staring at the ocean and, and you just see his creation and you're just like, wow, I got to worship God. Or maybe you're on top of a mountain and you just see the mountain, the clouds, the valleys. And you're like, wow, I, I just got to, I got to worship God for all of this. Maybe, maybe you like to duck hunt and I've heard guys who duck hunt sitting in duck blind saying, man, when I'm sitting in a duck blind and just looking out, I can't help but worship God. And the reason why is what you're doing is you're recognizing the work of his hand. So you're praising him because of what he has done. Uh, maybe God has done a work in your life, and when he's done a work in your life, you're declaring and praising him for the work that he's done in your life. And when you do that, that is reaching out towards others as well, helping them to see the things that God has the ability to do. But there's another side of, of worship, and it's what I call that vertical side. And that's where the angels are crying out, holy, 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 that I'm vertically wanting to worship you, that, that God, I'm totally wanting just to declare who you are. And, and this is how worship happens, all right, vertically and horizontally. But it doesn't necessarily happen like in a crossroads. I, I think there's a, a better way to, to visualize it, and I'd say it's like this, Okay? And when we come together, when we do a worship service right here in this room, this is how we try to connect with God. That we say, God, that we want to worship you, that we want to praise you for the work that you've done. And we kind of start at, at this level. If you notice, when you come in, we typically start with an upbeat song. We typically start with a song that, that is about praising uh, God, especially kind of the work that he has done. And we do that because, honestly, let's admit it, it's tough walking in, right? I mean, you've just wrestled the kids over to Kids Rock. You just tried to fight for a parking spot. You sat in line at C3 because you're like, you know what, I'm going to go, but I'm first going to get my coffee or my drink or whatever it is, you know what I mean? Maybe you fought with your wife on the way in, you know, and I'm sure, man, it was your fault, right, you know? But you know what I'm saying? Like, it's like we're just doing everything we can to get in and to get a seat. So it's like it's hard to start here. So we got to kind of start here and, and we start worshiping God and we start declaring what he's done. We start praising him. But if you notice, it's not like a flat horizontal line. It definitely has an, an incline because our goal is to continue worshiping and to move it towards this vertical response where we're just totally, totally declaring from our hearts, God, I want to worship you because of who you are. 
I want to worship you because you are God. You are Lord. You are Savior. You are King. You are the Mighty One. You are the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. And God, I can do nothing but worship you. And there's times that that you'll see, maybe if you have a church background, that what will happen is worship will happen like this. And then you get here, and then all of a sudden they put the sermon, right? And the sermon's kind of at the end uh, of the worship service. And if you've been at The Rock very long, you know that's not how we do it here. And the reason we don't is because we do not believe that the, the, the sermon is the best part of the service. Don't say amen. I heard somebody. No, do say amen. Because that's the truth. The, the sermon is not the focal point of the service. God is the focal point of the service. What we typically do here at The Rock is we put the sermon about right here. Because all my job is, all Matt's job, whoever might be up here teaching on stage, all our job is to do is to try to lead us towards God. That we just want to help encourage us on that worship of God. I just, my, my goal is in the middle of, of kind of worship, just say, guys, this is some things we need to discover about God. We need to be worshiping him. We need to be worshiping him for who he is. We need to be worshiping, worshiping him for what he's done in your life or what he is able to do in your life if you haven't surrendered to him yet or stuff like that, all right? So, so we want to put the sermon right here. Because what my goal is, is at this point, we'll start to discover some things about God, and then we'll continue to move towards response. And that's why at the end of every service, I wrap up at about right now. Because we want to leave at least 15 minutes at the end of the message so that we can truly respond. And next week, we'll talk about some of those ways of response, like communion, baptism, stuff like that. But for today, let's just start thinking about this concept of well, let's respond. And I truly believe this, that, that like this right here, that's the best part of the service. It's the best part because that's where you are having a chance to really come in contact with God and to respond to the things that he is, that he is planting in your heart, that respond to the movement of the Holy Spirit in your life. That's the chance for you to really just connect and respond to God. Negative, though, problem is, is a lot of us, we do this, and we take an off-ramp. We take an off-ramp because we think, oh, the sermon's done, so service is done. No. And the sermon's done so that we can continue responding and connecting to God. So here's what I want to challenge you to do today. Like I said, I've got a lot more I would love to share with you. And I will next week. We'll dig more into this story about Isaiah because I just got started. Verse 5 is incredible. Verse 8 is incredible. We'll tackle those next week. But for today, let's just move into this time that we can respond. And, and maybe you're like, yeah, and I recognize who God is. And I'm so thankful for the work that he has done in my life and the work that he has done here on this earth. And maybe what, what you need to do this morning is you just need to respond in worship. And your response might be coming up and taking communion. Your response might be singing at the top of your lungs. Your response might be taking a kneel, uh, just getting down on your knees right there where you sit or, or maybe coming up to the prayer corner and, and, and kneeling and just spending some time with God that way. But I want to invite you, if you're recognizing who God is and, and if you're able to recognize what he's done in your life, then truly worship him. Make him the object of this worship service. And worship him. Because here's what I know will happen. If we will do that, then there will be people who are also here with us this morning. And maybe for the first time in your life, you'll be like, wow. Man, God is here. God is here. And I want to connect to him. And here's what I want you to make sure you catch. Because I know that there's some of you that you think, well, there's no way God wants to connect with me. I know there's some of you watching that think there's no way God wants to connect with me. But I'm here to tell you, God desperately wants to connect with you. He wants to come into a one-on-one -on -one relationship with you. 
where he is the object of the relationship. And if you'll allow Christ to come into your life and allow him to be the object of your relationship, then you'll be amazed at the work that he will do in your life. So maybe what you'll do during this time is while, while others are really connecting with him, you'll be like, I want that and I need that. And I would just encourage you, just follow their example. Just follow their example and worship. And you might be like, man, I need to know what it means more about how to put Jesus in the center of my life. And I'll be standing back there at the connect corner. There'll be other uh, friends of mine back there as well. We'd love to talk to you about that. If you're at C3, if you're at J. Rubin, there's a host there will take care of you as well. But let's spend some time. Now that we maybe discovered a little bit of why we do what we do, why we sing the way we sing, why we put the message where we put it, let's spend some time responding to what it is we've discovered. That God is big and that he is at the center. So let's worship him for who he is and what he does. Would you stand with me? I'm going to pray and then we're going to respond. Jesus, thank you for this time. Thank you that we can be in this room, that, that, that we can gather. But God, thank you most of all that, that you are in this room and that you long to connect with us. So God, I pray that we would, we would do that right now. Jesus, help us to respond to the things we've discovered and worship you because you are on your throne and you are the subject of all worship. In your name, amen. Let's respond.